I greet you all in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's always a joy and privilege to be uh, in your midst. And we really do thank the Lord for your fellowship uh, in the faith and your support and your prayers for the Far Eastern Bible College. And truly may the Lord bless you richly. I hear of the good news that from next month onwards you will be worshipping in the morning. Well, it is good news for you. I rejoice with you to have a morning slot. At the same time, I feel also a bit sad because we have been having your pastor preaching to us quite regularly at True Life. And he, he comes readily because, you know, your service is in the afternoon, ours is in the morning. Now he told me I cannot come so often. So I feel quite sad. But I hope you'll still allow him to come now and then. Uh, to preach to us in the morning, even as you also worship in the morning. The Lord is good. Let us now turn to the Bible, to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And I'll read to you from verse 1 to verse 11. Acts chapter 3, verse 1 to 11. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, asked alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. He gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together under them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Faith healing or fake healing. Today we are living in a very confusing world. And the Christian world is no exception. The Christian world is also very confusing. We find the churches believing in so many different doctrines and having so many different practices and they do not agree not only they do not agree among themselves many of these doctrines and practices also do not agree with the holy scriptures right and today one phenomenon that we are seeing in many uh, churches especially the charismatic churches is this claim of faith healing so-called and all these uh, miracles that they claim to perform. The lame will walk, the blind will see, the dead will be raised. They claim. I wonder how many of us have been to such healing rallies or miracle crusades. I wonder how many of you have gone to attend and even to participate or maybe even to get healing from, the, from these so-called faith healers. How many here? have experienced these kinds of miraculous healings. Anyone? Well, I've been to one. I, I even went. I not only saw and participated, I even went forward to get healing. Was I healed or not? Maybe later on I'll share with you. But we see such phenomenon today. Is it from God or not? Many people seem to be confused over what the Bible teach, uh, what the Bible teaches about healing, especially of this sort, miraculous healing. And I want to submit to you that many of the healings, if not all the so-called 
Faith healings today in the charismatic churches are really not genuine, true healings, but, but fake healings, right? which are no healings at all. It's a very confusing world. And I just want to quote to you from this book, which is entitled The Confusing World of Benny Hinn. Now the number one healer is Benny Hinn. And there was one uh, time he came to Singapore right, uh, to do his healing. And he, can, and he, he seems to be very powerful. One you know, a swing of his hand or his arm, people will fall backwards, slain in the spirit. And over here in this book uh, by Richard Fisher and Kurt Goldman, they seek to document the healings of Benny Hinn, whether they were genuine healings or really false healings. And I just want to read one account here. And, and uh, they report... They report what was, uh, was reported in the Orlando Sent Sentinel and the reporter Mike Thomas uh, tried to document right, the healings that are found in Benny Hinn's crusades. But he found that the cases were not verifiable at all. I just want to quote to you, you know, uh, uh, what is stated here. The authors of this book wrote, Hinn claims to have the gift of healing. Thomas, that's Mike Thomas, a reporter for the Orlando Sentinel, report, reportedly sought from Hinn's organization uh, documented verifiable cases of healing performed by Hinn. And Thomas writes, and quoting Thomas, all right, uh, Thomas says this, Hinn says that about 1,000 people are miraculously cured of a variety of ailments at each crusade. He says he is a conduit for the Holy Spirit. Sometimes while preaching, he will stop and listen as the Spirit tells him something to pass on. But despite all the thousands of miracles claimed by Hinn, the church seems hard-pressed to come up with any that would convince a serious skeptic. If God cures through him, he does not cure ailments such as permanent paralysis, brain damage, retardation, physical de deformities, missing eyes, or other uh, obvious ailments. When pressed for truly convincing miracles, Susan Smith, who documents miracles for Hinn's church, cited a woman in Orlando who was cured of blindness caused by diabetes. But she would not give the woman's name. She later admitted the woman's vision may still be cloudy. Uh, this woman has been healed of blindness due to uh, uh, diabetes. Then how can she, her vision still be cloudy? You see, is it true healing or false healing? They could not give one instance where a miraculous healing can be verified. Okay. And then he goes on to, to note, even more disturbing than the failure to present docu documented healings is the fact that during a 1986 Oklahoma City crusade, an 85-year-old woman, Ella Peppard, died from complications suffered after someone who was slain in the spirit by him fell on her, fracturing her hip. So you go to Benny Hinn's crusade, you may not get healed. You go there waiting to be healed, someone slain by the spirit may fall on you and then you may die of, out, die of fracture. Right? Like this poor old woman, 85 years old, someone fell on her after being slain by the spirit and she died of hip fracture. What a tragedy. So you see these things happening today. And they are happening in the name of Christ, in the name of Christianity. What does the Bible teach? And I want to submit to you that these healings are not faith healings, but fake healing for three reasons. 
The first reason is that the healing claims cannot be verified at all. all right? Second reason is healing or no healing, the healing must rest solely on the faith of the sick, all right? they claim. And the third reason why such healings are not true but false healings because the healings are not instantaneous and the healings are not complete right, or full. And this is what we see today in the phenomenon that is found in the charismatic churches. If you have seen them and you have participated, you have observed, they do not square with what the Bible teaches. And here in Acts chapter 3, we have one episode, one instance of true, all right, true and miraculous healing. And we find the healing here to be so different from what we see today. The healing of Benny Hinn, for instance. But a healing that was done by the apostles Peter and John. It was such wonderful miracles, and nobody can deny, and the results were good results to the glory of God. Firstly, over here, right, let's look at the text now in Acts chapter 3. We see here that the healings, true healings, come from God because number one, it can be verified. It can be verified. Now over here, we find this paralyzed man. Okay? And there's no question over here that this man was crippled. For we read here in verse 2, right? in verse 2 we read, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So there's no question that this person, this man here, was crippled because every day he was there right, in the temple, and they could see very clearly that he was a paralyzed man, and they knew who he was. He probably uh, grew up right, uh, uh, in their midst. He was begging daily all this while in the temple, and we are told here that he was born lame from his mother's womb. So it was clearly he was paralyzed, he was crippled, and, he was, and, and every day he was there begging for money because he could not do any work. He had to depend on the grace, the mercy, and the charity of others. And he was there, and everyone could see him. We are not told exactly how long he has been begging for money. It could be from time when he was very young. All this while, until his adult years, he was begging for money daily. And it, is, and it can be verifiable. I don't think over here, it was someone who pretended to be lame, I mean, there may be those out there begging for money who may uh, pretend right, to, be, to be crippled or to be blind or to have some physical ailment. Some may even pretend to be blind, holding a blind man's walking stick, put on sunglasses or dark glasses, begging for money, pretending to be blind, but actually they can see. Right? After they collect all their money, take off their specs, and then they walk home. And uh, you can fool! Uh, some people some of the time, but you can not fool all the people all the time. So over here, it is not a case where it is something of a trickery or something that was a pretense. It was a genuine case of someone who was there, been there for a long time, daily begging for money because he was crippled. Right? He could not help himself. He needed others to help him, uh, to show charity to him. So this was a genuine case, no doubt about it. Everybody knew it. It can be verified. And, every, and in verse 10, we also told, and they knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And after he was healed, all right, they knew him. He was no stranger to the crowds. All these things could be publicly attested and known for sure. So take note of this. But in charismatic healings, in these miracle crusades, uh, you don't find this to be the case. Such things cannot be verified, whether the person was truly sick or not. And many a time they will wheel into the, into, on, onto stage 
someone sitting on a wheelchair. So people come from, for healing. We don't know what kind of ailment they have. But if you are sick, they put you on a wheelchair, make you feel comfortable, and then they wheel one by one onto the stage. And then the faith healer will say, in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed, rise up and walk. And then they start walking. And then the faith healer will say, praise the Lord, what a miracle. He could not walk. He was in a wheelchair and now he can walk. But how do we know he couldn't walk in the first place? Maybe he could already walk. Right? And you put him on a wheelchair, giving people the impression that he could not walk. But actually he could walk already. See, all these are staged. A whole lot of trickery and, and these are charlatans to trick uh, people. When they have no ability to heal, they say these people are healed. They could already walk in the wheelchair and later they stand up walking and say there's a healing. And, and you know, let me just read also what uh, this book says, what Benny Hinn did, which are not verifiable at all. I'll just uh, quote from page 64 this time. It says here, one sad example of Hinn's empty miracles is Ernestine Rodriguez of Santa Fe, New Mexico, purportedly healed of brain cancer during his December 1992 Houston crusade. Hinn took her and repeatedly slayed her in the spirit, proclaiming, Satan, you've lost this one and you'll never get her back. The spectacle was shown on Hinn's nationwide broadcast. What Hinn didn't know was that producers from the television program Inside Edition were present when medical tests were performed on Rodriguez three weeks later. And the test showed the cancer still there. He says this person has been healed of cancer, no more, delivered, Satan is defeated, Satan can never get this person back again, he has lost this one, but then when it was checked, Medical records show this man, three weeks later, still suffering from cancer. See, Faced with mounting charges against him, Hinn re responded on the March 4th, 1993, broadcast of the Praise the Lord show. Instead of expressing repentance for his undocumented proclamation of healing and his declaration, Satan, you've lost this one and you'll never get her back, he said. Really, there was no definite healing, which we found out afterwards. And why do you say so most confidently this person has been healed, cancer gone, Satan is defeated, Satan has lost this one, and then now with hard facts, the cancer is still there, he says, oh really, there was no definite healing. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And so here there's a double speak. On the one hand, he says, totally healed. Satan has lost this one. Satan is defeated. And then when showed documented facts, oh, no. He wasn't really healed. Yes and no. Yes and no. It's very confusing. Speaking lies. This double speaking. The fog tongue of the snake over here. Really, there was no definite healing, which we found out afterwards. He then evaded any responsibility, saying, there are cases where someone may receive something and not keep it or something goes wrong that I'm not even sure, fully, I understand yet. I do know this, healing is received by and must be kept by faith. There's been, uh, there's been the cases where they've lost their healings. You can lose your healing. It's a convenient way of excusing himself, isn't it? You know, it's sort of a win-win situation for him, when these charismatic healers go around trying to heal, and if the person is healed, oh, that's because of me. And when they don't get healed, oh, it's because of you, because you don't have faith, or you don't have enough faith to keep the healing, that's why you, you have lost that healing. It's a win-win situation for these fake healers, right? But here in Acts chapter 3, with regard to Peter and John, was it the faith of this crippled, paralyzed man from his 
from the time when he was born? Was it his faith that saved him and made him well? Or was it the faith of the apostles themselves? The faith of Peter and John? So, firstly, we know that the, the healing that, that occurred here in the temple, we know, was true and genuine because it can be verified. This man was healed and people knew he was crippled from birth and now healed he was jumping and leaping all over the place, showing that the healing was perfect and complete. And they knew that he was truly a crippled man. It could be verified. And the second reason is the healing here was true healing because it was based upon or performed by apostolic faith, true faith of the apostles of Jesus Christ. And they were given that power to perform all these signs and wonders, these miracles, okay, to authenticate their ministry and their message. And that's why Peter and John had this confidence that they could uh, heal this crippled man. It's not due to his faith in any way. It was due to their faith, their faith, their believing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who had commissioned them in a special way. You go, right? Don't be unbelieving, but be believing and go. And these signs will follow you when you believe and you will do all these things, cast out demons, heal the sick, right? Uh, tread on serpents and not hurt you and things of that sort that we read in Mark 16. And here we find the case. Peter and John went with that kind of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who had commissioned them to go. And so here in verse 5, we see this, right? In verse 5. Maybe we can read from verse 4. So here, Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. So when Peter and John were about to enter into the temple, there was this crippled man, paralyzed man, who was begging for money, begging for alms. And Peter and John, about to go in the temple, uh, uh, fastened right, their eyes upon this, upon this man, who was begging for money, and said, look on us, look on us. Okay. And this, of course, uh, tells us that it is not the faith of this crippled man that saved him. In fact, he was not thinking of getting any healing whatsoever. He was sitting there begging for money. He was expecting to get money. And when Peter and John told him, look on us, and when he looked at Peter and, and John, he was thinking, oh, maybe I will get some right, small change from these two gentlemen. Right? He was looking for money. He was not looking for any miracle or any healing. But nonetheless, Peter and John says, look on us. And then what did Peter and John say? Silver and gold have I none, but what I have, I give to you. What do I have? It's not what you have. It's not your faith. It is my faith in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who had commissioned me in a special way as his apostle and empowered me with this special gift of healing that I'm able to do this for you. Okay. Silver and gold have I none. Yes, as poor ministers of the gospel, they did not have any money. Silver and gold, they don't have that kind of, they, have, they, they don't have so much money. Silver and gold, maybe a few pennies right, and coins. But silver and gold, I have none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And of course, when Peter and John said these words, they had full confidence that the miraculous healing will come. This man, born crippled, maybe born without legs, from the time he was born, begging for money all these years, every day, begging. And this is some stupendous miracle unless you're very sure you can heal. You dare not heal. But Peter and John had full confidence, not in themselves, but in the Lord Jesus Christ who had commanded them, commissioned them, and empowered them with this special gift of performing signs and wonders 
so that people, when they, when they hear him, when they hear them, will know that they are truly God's servants, that every word they preach, every word they teach, every word they write are the very words of God, infallible and inerrant. They will listen, right? and, they will, and those who believe will come under the authority of their ministry. That was the purpose, and Peter and John are very sure of that. No double speaking. Maybe you can be healed, or maybe not. They have full confidence that this man will surely be healed. But in the case of such fake healers, it's always yes and no. If you're healed, it's yes. If you're not healed, well, it's no. And, and the fault lies with whom? Not with me, but with you, because you have no faith. Over here you have an instance where no faith was exercised by this crippled man. He was there. He was just looking for money. Small change from those who come in and out of the temple. And it was the faith of Peter and John who healed this man right? in the name of Jesus Christ. And then verse 7 we are told, And he took him by the hand, by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Right, received strength. Now, so this is the third, the third reason why uh, uh, this healing must be a true one. Fake healing, all right, many of the healings that we see today that are found in charismatic churches, they are not instantaneous. Um, and they are not complete either. There's one instance where one man was said to be healed in one eye. But he was, right, he was short-sighted in both eyes. And then he says, now I'm healed in one eye, but the other eye, I must come next week to get healing. I mean, if there's healing of the sight, then it must be total, it must be immediate, it must be, immediate, it must be complete, it must be perfect. He would get 20-20 eyesight on both eyes. But in many cases, it's not, it's not true, it's not the fact. But over here, we find someone who was perfectly healed. It was instantaneous. It was complete. As we see in verse 7, For he was immediately, he was immediately healed. His feet and ankle bones received strength. And then verse 8, we read, And he, leaping up, right, stood and walked and entered with them in the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. No doubt about it that he was completely, totally, perfectly healed. Brand new legs, legs that were withered away, right, are now given muscle and strength. And, and take note, he was not, you know, uh, limping away, but leaping away. So the, he could not walk. And when he began to walk, it's not, you know, in slow steps, limping away. You find that when a miracle is performed, it was total, it was complete, it was perfect. He, he was leaping away. I think if he had participated in the Olympic Games, he may just win gold medal for high jump. Right? Leap, leaping away, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with, into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God for the first time in his life. Praising God. And he was, ex being, was able to experience all these things. Brand new pair of legs full of health, full of strength, right, and full of uh, vitality. So no doubt about it, it was instantaneous, full and complete. But you find that in such cases that you find in many of these charismatic healing crusades, no such healing took place. I had an experience, you know, and I shared this in my Thursday night class, how there was one time I went uh, to this meeting, there was this lady evangelist who came from India, and she shared a testimony how she was she had a near death experience, and how God miraculously delivered her, saved her, and then after God saved her, God appeared to her, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to her and commissioned her to be an apostle, and even gave her the gift of healing. So she says she has, she has the power to perform miracles and to heal. And then gave a lot of testimonies how she was very successful and so on and so forth. And so in that meeting, and I was a young Christian at that time, and she gave a very persuasive message. And she, and she invited all those of you who are sick, 
you need healing, you come to me. I'll pray for you and I can heal you. So at that time, uh, well, it so happened that I was not feeling very well. Right? I had a very sore throat, a, a very bad throat, which was very painful. Not so serious like, uh, you know, uh, like a crippled man or, or uh, suffering from cancer or some of these, any of these diseases, but a bad throat. But it's an ailment nonetheless, right? And if God can make the blind to see, the lame to walk, and raise the dead, and she claims she can do all these things, surely this small sickness that I have, God can heal miraculously. And I had the faith to believe. And of course, at that time, I was keen to experience the power of God as well. Because, well, in the Bible, we read of such miracles. So I, I believe in my Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he has the power. I went by faith, right? knowing that I can be healed. And she gave such a powerful, persuasive message. She was able to heal. Jesus sent her and gave her the power. So, and some others also went, and all of us knelt down before her. She went one by one, came to my turn. Right? And, and, I, and she asked me, now, what is your request? I said, I have a very sore throat, very painful. I, I want healing. So she said, okay. She put one hand on my head, right, and the other hand she put on my throat. And then, in an, and then in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed, she said. Then she asked me, how do you feel? And I said, still the same. And it was true. I mean, it was still painful. I, I didn't feel anything. It was, I, I still felt so I didn't feel that, well, suddenly there was electricity that flowed into my body and then suddenly, zap, wah, the throat become very fresh, very good, all right? No more pain, no more ticklish, no more coughing. Uh, it, it was still there. Did she have the power to heal? And since I said it was still the same, she tried the second time. Now, if you really have the power to heal, the very first time you should have been able to heal me perfectly, completely, instantaneously, correct? Just like the Apostle Peter and John here. No need for a second try. If it was really a miracle, God will cause everyone right, to be convinced and to be very sure, to be able to see very clearly a miracle had happened without any doubt whatsoever. And this was what happened here in the case of Peter and John and this crippled man. Nobody doubted at all that healing had happened. For in verse, uh, you know, in verse 10, people all knew that it was he which sat in arms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were all filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. They did not question that a miracle had indeed happened. They only wondered how, how did it happen? You see? And there was no second try, no second chance. But for my case, there was this second chance and second try. So I gave her a second chance. So she said, all right, let me pray for you again. So she put again her hand on my head and then her, the other hand she put on my throat. But this time, she gripped it tighter, right? The grip was tighter. Maybe like that, more power. And she shouted this time with a louder voice in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. And then he shook my head. <laughs> After that, didn't ask me whether I was feeling okay or not. No third chance. She went immediately to the next one. Was I healed? I felt worse. Maybe I, you know, it was her way of punishing me. No healing. And I was a bit confused. How is that the case? I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he has the power to heal. And she says she's a servant of God, an apostle. Jesus appeared to her, gave her the power. She has this power to make the blind to see, the lame to walk, and even raise the dead. How come I, I'm not healed? Very confusing. And some people may even think, if I'm not healed, then am I truly a Christian? Is it 
Jesus doesn't love me anymore? Why he did not hear right, this prayer, my desire to be healed? And this can cause a whole lot of confusion and doubt on a young believer, these kinds of fake healing, because it sends out the wrong message. And then they use the name of Jesus Christ. And when there's no healing, then what would the unbelievers think? If there are unbelievers in the midst, say, oh, you, you do this in the name of Christ and there's no healing. Therefore, Jesus is not God. Jesus cannot be true. Christian religion is false, right? People will go about thinking that way because they go around using the name of Christ and then no miracles happen and the unbelievers will ridicule the Christian faith, giving them a chance to ridicule the Christian faith. All this confusion out there. Satan, of course, is very clever. And he appears as an angel of light. But then he goes about deceiving, deceiving many people. And how we thank God that we have his word so that we can test every spirit, test all these activities in the light of the Holy Scriptures. And we find that, you know, all these things that are happening in the charismatic churches, so-called faith healing, are really fake healing, when we see the things that they do, they do not square with what we read in the Scriptures. What we see here in Acts chapter 3, where the apostle Peter and John were truly right, genuine servants of the Lord, sent by the Lord Jesus Christ, really, truly empowered with the gift. And what they did, they did successfully, right, completely, perfectly, without any loss, without any failure. And everybody could see and it could be verified, you see. And of course, God's name was greatly glorified. But today, what we see, God's name is not glorified at all. In fact, it only gives ammunition for skeptics to ridicule the Christian faith. When these people say they are able to heal in the name of Christ, but no such healing. So many instances, Benny Hinn. And the sad thing is, many people are so gullible to fall into the trap of these people. And did not Jesus already warn in the last days, right? You turn to Matthew 24, that we can expect to see all these things. These things should not take us by surprise, for they are false cries and false prophets. Just before the Lord comes back, one of the important signs the Lord tells us, how do you know I'm coming back very soon? You know I'm coming back very soon. When you see these things happening, one of the signs will be, false Christ and false prophets, and they'll be all over the place. And Jesus here warned three times of such a thing, false Christ and false prophets. For instance, we read in verse 4 and 5, the first time Jesus warned of false Christ and false prophets, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. False cries with their false Christianity. Beware of them. Second time Jesus warned of this is in verse 11. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. They deceive many. And then verse 24, which is most descriptive. For there shall arise false cries and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. They can perform these miracles, but they are counterfeit miracles and fake miracles, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. But these are false cries. And on the last day, what will happen to them? Will they enter into the kingdom of God? Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus already already predicted the fate, the final destiny of such fake healers. They're not faith healers. They have no faith at all. They are fake healers. For in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Verse 
Now look at verse 15. Jesus warned here, beware of false Christ, false prophets, right? Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Outwardly they look pious, they look like religious teachers, all right? They may wear a cross, they, they, they use, they bear the name of Christ, they look like Christians, but inside they are not. They look like sheep. But inside, they are wolves seeking to deceive, to destroy, to sow confusion, right? To thwart uh, the Christian faith. And then in verse 21, we, we are told, Not everyone, Jesus said, Not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not impressed if you call him Lord, Lord, as if that would mean anything. It's not what you say, it's not just what you say or what you confess, but also whether your life squares with your confession of faith or not. Has your life changed? Have you experienced the miracle of a changed life by the power of the resurrection of Christ? Now that is the point. But these people have never been born again. And God is not impressed with just lip service, right? but no heart transformation at all, no manifestation of the marks of grace at all in our lives. So there are these people saying, Lord, Lord, and Jesus says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, many, just like what Jesus said in Matthew 24, many false cries, false prophets, and shall deceive many. Many will follow them and call him Lord, Lord. And Jesus says, says here, many will say to me, not few, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You are working iniquity. They use the name of Christ to do all these things. They are workers of iniquity because they make merchandise of the people and they peddle the name of Christ for profit. They line their own pockets. That's what they do. And what they do do not agree, do not square, is not based in God's word. That's why it is sinful. All that we see and do, we must make sure that it squares, it agrees, it finds basis in the Word of God, the Word of God alone. So please understand this and be very discerning, be very wise. In this world, yes, the Lord has sent, out, sent us out as sheep, in the midst of wolves, so we must be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, be wise in God's word. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear God. Have the highest regard for his word. Study his word, meditate on his word, apply his words. And then you'll be protected from the dangers that surround us. You will not be confused. Your mind will be clear. And your heart will be built up in the faith. And what is, what is true miracle today? Our God today still performs miracles. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ today still heals, and he heals directly. And what is the most powerful miracle that he performs today? It would be something that I pray you yourself experience, every one of us can experience and should experience this miracle of God, the miracle of the spiritual birth, of being born again. That is a miracle. Once we were dead in our sins, and now we are alive in Christ. One point in time, we are so miserable. We don't know, do not know where we come from, why we are here, where we are going. We are just told we are just improved monkeys or glorified apes. But then the truth is told to us, no, God made us special in his image. And we have sinned against him. We have fallen. 
But Jesus Christ, God loves us so much, he sent his only begotten son to come and die for our sins, shedding his precious blood. And then he rose from the dead. And if we believe on him, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God had raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Sins forgiven. Holy Spirit comes in. And, the, and a miracle takes place. Once upon a time, we were addicted to smoking, to drinking, womanizing, gambling, drugs, whatever. Suddenly, that bondage that we were in, chained up by Satan, chained up by our sin, chained up by the lust of the world, which we could not break free from, suddenly is broken. And we are free from all these things, released because of the powerful, miraculous working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Have you not experienced that? All of us who are children of God have experienced at least this one miracle in our life. When that happens, you know for sure it's a miracle. You know in and of yourself you have no strength. You are hopeless. And Jesus Christ came, gave you hope. You were helpless. He helped you and he released you. And now you know for sure, 100%, when Jesus comes back or when our life on earth is over, we are very sure we are in heaven. Not because we are good, but because Jesus is good and he has done all the good works for us. He has performed this miracle in our lives. We experience it. We know him and the Holy Spirit in our hearts witness within, within us of this truth and this fact. And then every day in our lives, we see God performing miracles in our life. How he sanctifies us. He makes us more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have the power to overcome all these things. And then when we pray to the Lord, uh, he is the living and true God who hears and answers our prayers. And we see things happening in our life that you know, we cannot explain. We see his powerful working. Do you experience God in such a way? Yes, our God is, is the living and true God and he's still working powerfully and even miraculously in our lives by his powerful invisible hand. It's for you and for me to experience this in the light of God's word Right, being filled with the Holy Spirit and following Jesus Christ and Him alone. And then we'll see all these miraculous things happening in our life day in and day out when we see Him in control of our lives and Him being very real in our lives. And if we are so full of and filled with hatred, sometimes the hatred is a very powerful thing that grips us, it will not let go. And in our own strength, we cannot. But when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we experience his forgiveness, suddenly you find this hatred all what disappeared. You find yourself being able to love others, even your enemies you can love. How did this come about? This is not from the earth. The earth cannot give such a thing. This must come from God, you see. You know this. You experience this. And you experience the power of God. That is faith healing. True faith healing, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 100%, without doubt, without question, then he works powerfully in your life and you experience his miracle in your life every day. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For they that cometh to him must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He rewards us. Rewards us with, uh, with what? with all these special, miraculous graces and strength that we need day in and day out in our lives. Do you experience this? Some, you know, it's something very hard to explain with words. You must experience it for yourself. These are the miracles we should be looking for, not the fake miracles that are going around today in all these mega churches. Okay. So please understand this. And if you have not experienced the miracle of God in your life, you're still outside of God's kingdom. You do not know the Lord Jesus Christ yet. And you know you're guilty. Guilty of breaking God's commandments. You know you have, you have sin in your life. And you know at the end there will be a judgment to come. And you feel utterly miserable. God is very angry with you. There is salvation. God wants to do a miracle in your life right now. To make you his child. You might be born again. And how to 
get this, how to experience this miracle? Faith. And when you have faith, you believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross, shedding his precious blood according to the scriptures. And he was buried on the third day. He rose from the dead according to the scriptures. If you believe this good news, you experience this miraculous healing in your life. The power of sin is broken. The power of Satan is broken. The power of death is broken. The sting of sin is death. We are all afraid to die. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are no longer afraid because we know that he, will, he has given to us eternal life and we, are, we will live forever with him as he has promised because he has saved us from our sins. Will you not do this? I thank the Lord that you are going out for evangelism. And that is really offering true faith healing to people out there. The healing of their souls by the invisible power of God through the preaching of the gospel and the reception of that gospel by faith. May the Lord help us to understand this and help us to do true healing, by, tr uh, to, to engage in true healing, which is faith healing in the true sense and not fake healing that we see in many places today. May the Lord help us. Let us pray.